is there anything else besides start the video when you hit that? I unmuted it. No. Good evening, you guys. My name is Peyton Marshall. I'm a reporter for Dayton 24-7 Now News, and tonight I'm going to be your host. Well, me and the saber-toothed cat. He doesn't speak much, but uh, he's just as active as me, and we are going to show you the Boone Shop tonight. Now, tonight we are celebrating, and the Boone Shop for me has become a very important place. It's somewhere near and dear to my heart. I've spent a lot of time here. Valentine's Day, I spent at the planetarium under the stars. I spent time with the kids for the summer kids camp. And of course, I have spent time with the animals, the turtles, the otters. Well, the otters, when they wake up for me at 5 a.m., because I do come here very early. But like I said, tonight is a night to celebrate the Boon Shop, as tonight is their annual fundraiser. It's the largest fundraiser, and things are a little bit different this year, as I am talking to you right now through a camera, which, granted, is not that weird for me on a daily basis. But for a fundraiser like tonight, we want to be close. We want to be with each other. And just because we can't physically be together doesn't mean we're not going to connect tonight. We have a very exciting show for you, and right now, I'm going to introduce to you CEO Tracy Tommy, and when she comes, I'm going to be stepping back, you guys. I'm going to be six feet apart because, like I said, things are weird. It's a weird time, but even though we're doing things virtually, we are doing them right. So, Tracy, if you could come and talk to us a little bit about the Boone Shop and why tonight is so important. Thanks, Peyton. Yes, so I welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, I think tonight's going to be very different, but very special. Very and special because we're matching already. I know, right? So we're on I a right it. note. <laughs> it wasn't it's even planned. Well, what to point. wear. This is what to wear. Uh, so yeah, I want to thank you for that. I also have just, to thank uh, ABC 22 Fox 45 for all of their support they have given in letting us have you this evening and all of the help with the video and, and everything that's happening. Um, and also, of course, our team. Our team has done so much here to get ready for this and all the different segments we're going to bring to you. Which are very exciting. We've there got is. a lot of segments prepared for you guys. We do, yeah. <laughs> and then, I, I, you know, we almost thought we weren't going to have this because, I mean, we've been closed. Uh, we were trying to be very socially distance conscious and take care of everybody's health. And, and that's important right now. But, you know, our sponsors really came through and they, they wanted us to do it. And I think many of our... Um, Members were very excited to see what we could do to get creative and be entertaining for the next hour. And we'll find out. We'll so, find out. You guys will see. You'll have to Here we know. go. <laughs> hey, Peyton, did you know that I know you really like this saber tooth cat? I do. All right. Did you know we actually have a replica of a saber tooth cat skull in the auction? It is in the auction. It's in the auction. It's, we, we have a gentleman on staff who works in our collections and, and a couple other people, of course, who help him with that. But he has made copy number one of our actual saber tooth cat skull and we have held it for this auction okay. so it is going to be the most closely representative of the actual skull that you can get okay, well tracy say no more i'm going to go to the auction so that i can show you guys all of the different items tracy you take it away you tell them more about all of the details check out those items I will. We're excited. Oh boy, we're excited. So um, yes, there's many things happening the e this evening. As we thank you and we reach out to you to help us continue our mission to this community, I think that the Boonshoff Museum is very important to everything throughout the Dayton area. And we really bring in that natural history piece, uh, curate almost two million objects in our collection from all over the world, representing all types of different cultures, which I think is very representative of Dayton. So um, much of what you see tonight as we go bash to basics and really remember where we came from and why we are here, we're going to break that down into four main areas being biology, astronomy, STEM, and history. And we're going to bring you a little bit of information on each one of those, so stick with us. I'm going to go see what Peyton's found in the auction. Come on in, Peyton. Check out the auction. Oh, and I see my cat skull is already here. He's mm -hmm. already with me. Yes. Can you, can you talk to me a little bit about it? Give us some 
Yeah. As well. So you just saw a replica of the saber tooth cat in the lobby. This one's different. This is a cast of the actual saber tooth cat that we have in the collection. So the real specimen came to us from La Brea Tar Pits and our um, exhibits department and collections department created a mold of this. And this is the very first one to come out of the mold. So it's very detailed, very close to the original. So the original is about 10,000 years old. You know, if you're looking at this maybe on your mantle in your home, for example, nobody will know that it's not real. <laughs> right. It's I very well done. That's a cool. You would have to yeah. educate me. Mm -hmm. So we talked about my favorite, but Jill, I don't know what your favorite is. A lot of different items. Oh man, so there are so many beautiful objects in this room. Um, if you look uh, right behind you there, we have some great prints uh, made by the animals in our zoo. Um, we have some jewelry made from kind of the porcupine earrings and footprints and all types of things. We have American Indian baskets. We also have some really great gift baskets as well. And, and we also have the Cleopatra. Can you talk to me yeah. a little bit about her as well? Yes. So my absolute favorite um, of all of the items in the room is this painting behind us here. And as you said, it kind of looks like Cleopatra. Kind of looks. A little bit, right? So, uh, but it's not. It's actually a painting of our mummy Nessier. Oh my goodness, and I saw it a couple months ago as well. Yeah, so Nessier, um, she's been on continuous display since 1926 when she was donated. And a couple years ago, we partnered with Dayton Children's Hospital and we had a CT scan done of Nessier. And we used that CT scan data to basically pull out um, the skeletal data from that and create a new 3D rendering. But if you look at that rendering of what she looked like, it's very stoic. It's very clearly uh, like a computer generated thing, right? So you don't see like any uh, personality in the face. It's kind the of detail. A, yes. Oh, can, can we see it again? Yeah. Give us, give us. Again, Just not right. very, not very. Imagery right here. <laughs> so um, one of our uh, staff members, his name is Michael Sampson, and he's an artist. Uh, he works in our marketing department. And he took that rendering and created a more lifelike portrait of Nessier. He did so much work to understand who she was as a woman, where she lived, how old she was, all these things. And this portrait really depicts her in a way much more realistically, how she would have looked in life. And if you just look into her eyes, she's very, very captivating. So there's so much more detail going into yeah. this piece, I yes. would say, as well. Yeah. So that's absolutely my favorite. I'm telling you, if somebody wants to buy that and donate it back to us, I would gladly display it in the gallery because it is amazing. So it sounds like they're going to take it yourself. I, don't know I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> but also, you guys, I don't know if you can see right now, my feet are on a rug. Mm -hmm. Bougie. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a Turkman rug. It was donated by former curator Jay Heilman. And what I love about this rug is it's all handmade. So like you can go to like any department store and buy a rug, but this rug, it's traditionally made. It's hand dyed. It's so beautiful. It's so soft. It has some abstract peacocks on it. Beautiful bright colors. I don't even think looking at the camera, you can see how beautiful this rug is. So this would look great in anybody's home and it would be a steal. And you can't, I don't even know if you guys can really see just the amount of detail on here as well. But we also have lots of animals. The Boot Shop, after all, is all about the animals as well. Yeah. We have a couple of different items. I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of them, but the favorite animal. My favorite animal is probably, if you look up here, we have a hand-carved, hand-painted, pileated woodpecker. And that is a beautiful piece. It has dimension, it's three-dimensional, it's a great piece, and it's kind of a one-of-a-lifetime purchase. So definitely check that one out on the site. Well, thank you so much, Jill. You're welcome. You got a little bit of that background. And right now, speaking of background, I'm gonna send it over to Tracy, and she's gonna give us some of the history of the Boom Shop. Thank you, Peyton. I would love to share the history of the museum with everyone. We only have an hour tonight. I'm from Texas. I do like a good long story, and trust me, it is a very long story. But the museum began back in 1893 as part of the Dayton Public Library. From there, our collections grew and grew and grew, and we ended up moving several times out of the library to the Steely Building, back to the library, out again to the Roberts Pump Building, and then eventually we ended up landing here on Ridge Avenue in this beautiful building. In the 1990s, we had many renovations made to the building and that's what actually moved our entrance from Ridge 
over to Deweese Parkway. Then, after a big donation from Oscar Boonshoff, we actually changed our name to the Boonshoff Museum of Discovery, where we currently curate nearly two million objects, including artifacts and specimens in the areas of anthropology, biology, geology, and of course, astronomy, my favorite. We're an accredited zoo, science center, museum, and children's museum. We certainly have something for everyone. I am pleased and it's my pleasure to serve as the 20th director of the Dayton Society of Natural History, going back to William Judkins Conklin in 1893. But I do want to talk about someone who's truly inspired me as one of the former directors here, and that's E.J. Kessner. E.J. Kessner was the executive director from 1952 to 1986. E.J. was the founding director of the Dayton Society of Natural History. He led us into an era of educating the community, and it's people like E.J. that really inspired our theme tonight of Bash to Basics. We want everyone out there to remember why the museum is here and what we do for our community. We have all of these objects in our collection, but why? They're for you, they're for the community to learn from, to experience, to share with each other as families, as individuals. And we wanna continue that tradition for the next 127 years. So at tonight, I do wanna share another piece that I have, and this is from EJ. This is actually from his collection that he gave to the museum. And this was from his mother. So his mom's name is Emma, and this was hers. It was actually made in Mexico in 1930 and then donated to the museum by EJ himself so that we could remember Emma and how much the museum meant to EJ. EJ died in 2012, and I never knew him, but I do think he would be very proud to see what we're doing today, our staff, our commitment to continuing our mission, even during these times, and everything that the community has done for us to keep us going and keep us strong. So the Dayton Society of Natural History actually has two locations, the Boonshaw Museum of Discovery and Sunwatch Indian Village and Archaeological Park. At this time, I want to turn it over to Taylor, our site manager out there, and let her tell you a little bit of the history of that location. Thanks, Tracy. I'm here at Sunwatch Indian Village and Archaeological Park a partially reconstructed American Indian village and interpretive center located along the banks of the Great Miami. But it wasn't always as such. In the 1970s, the city of Dayton had plans to expand a nearby sewage treatment plant onto the property. However, a couple local amateur archaeologists realized that there was a significant find here and contacted James Heilman, the then curator of anthropology at the Dayton Society of Natural History, to get us involved to try and save the site. In the 1970s, we got involved and salvage excavations began happening. And as they excavated, they started finding some really interesting things, like an entire stockaded village, which we have partially reconstructed out back that you can tour through. We have reconstructed some of the buildings and we are open throughout the week. With the involvement of the community, the cooperation of the city of Dayton, donors like you and countless volunteers, we were able to save the site and build this interpretive center so that you can come visit, school groups can come through, and it's an absolutely wonderful experience. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We couldn't do it without your support, and we cannot thank you enough. Back to you, Peyton. And thank you so much, Taylor. You know, it's one thing to love the Boonshaft. It's another thing to appreciate it. And that is what the history really gifts to us. And right now, I'm inside the indoor zoo. You know, here they have meerkats. They have otters, as you guys know, are my favorites. And we have, oh my goodness, he's camera shy. You guys, he was right here, right before we got started. They are having dinner right now, the foxes. It is Denise and Wyatt. Denise and Wyatt just don't like me tonight. I don't know what it is, but it's okay because we're going to see some more animals. I'm going to toss it over to Stephanie, who's going to show us some talented animals who, who aren't camera shy. Stephanie, go ahead and show us. Thank you, Peyton. Sure. 
And the AZA is really the gold standard for animal care, animal welfare, and also ensuring that zoos are helping with conservation programs and also educating their visitors about the animals that live there. And like I said, Boonshoff Museum is home to about 150 different animals from quite a few different species. And we have some of our most popular animals are North American river otters, Eno and Sikwa. Patience, our Lynn's two-fingered sloth, is also extremely popular lately, and we do lots of fun things with her. And then we also have other animals. We have a saltwater reef tank. We have a three-banded armadillo named Sheldon, who's very, very popular. And we have a lot of different, very interesting animals that live here at the Boonshoff Museum. And actually, some interesting animals that you may not see at a larger zoo. So it does make the Boonshoff Museum, as well as a children's museum, natural history museum, planetarium, we are an accredited zoo as well. And out of about 2,000 zoos in the country, only around 240 are accredited by the AZA. So we do, it's something we're very proud of. We feel very privileged to be part of the AZA. And the AZA actually gives us a lot of interesting resources to help us take better care of our animals. So if we have a question about an animal, there's probably nothing online about how to take care of a meerkat, but maybe we're having a medical problem with one of our meerkats, we can contact a keeper at another AZA zoo and be like, hey, have you seen this problem before? What can we do to address it? And do you have any other advice with how to address this medical problem? So being in the AZA does give us a lot of perks as well as just that name recognition of being in the AZA. And most of the animals that live here at the Boonshoff Museum actually come from other AZA institutions. We have a few animals that were injured in the wild and could not survive on their own, and that's how they came here to the Boonshoff Museum. We have a few animals that were former pets, but really none of our animals are just stolen out of the wild like a lot of people think that zoos do. Zoos are conservation organizations first and foremost, so we do not want to do anything that would hurt animals and their populations in the wild. And here at the Boonshoff Museum, we do a lot to take care of our animals. So there's a lot of important things that we need to do. Just like with your pets at home, we do the same things with our animals. We just kind of kick it up a notch a little bit. So for our animals, they're receiving healthy foods. So we are giving them a nutritious, healthy foods that are appropriate for those animals to eat. Our animals are also taken to the vet, usually once a year, once every other year. And um, they are also closely monitored by our keeper staff. So there's different things that our keepers do every day to make sure that the animals that they're taking care of are happy and healthy. And one way that we do keep our animals happy and we keep them healthy is through animal enrichment. And animal enrichment can be just about anything. Our river otters actually really love to play with spoons. So you wouldn't expect a spoon to be a fun toy for an otter, but that is one of their favorite toys. So enrichment can be toys. It can be piles of dirt for the meerkats to dig in. It can be different smells for our armadillo who really loves to smell different things. Um, so enrichment can be just about anything. And one way we do enrichment is actually through animal painting. So Bob, our Madagascar hissing cockroach here, is going to show Show off his painting skills and like I said this is a form of enrichment so our animals we do not force them to do anything they don't want to do so Bob here I'm just gonna dip his little feet in the paint and then let him walk across the paint um, our paint canvas here so for most of our animals we can put the paint on one side put the food on the other side and then walk through the paint to get to the food so it is voluntary for the animals we are also using safe non-toxic paint because here at the museum and as animal caregivers our main goal is to make sure our animals stay nice, happy, and healthy. So we are always doing our best to take care of our animals and make sure that they are not scared or stressed or anything like that. Because our zookeepers and our animal care staff do really love the animals that live here. A lot of our keepers have a favorite animal that they have a special bond with. I probably have a special bond with our sloth patient. She is one of my personal favorites. I've worked with her for over four years, so you do kind of get to know them, and I like to say, really, animals are some of my very best friends. So our goal here at the museum, since we do care so much for the animals, is to give these animals the best life we possibly can here at the Boonshoff Museum. And we are going to talk to someone in just a second who also loves the animals here at the museum, just as much as our animal keepers. But before that, we will meet Lennox, our ball python. So Lennox is going to get ready to paint here in just a second. And while he's working on his special masterpiece, Melody's going to tell us about how much she loves the animals here at the Boonshoff Museum and how she has helped us to take care of the animals. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Melody. How old are you? Six. Melody, can you tell me why you love Boonshoff Children's Museum so much? 
because we get to see all sorts of fishies and animals and have cool places that we can play and stuff. Yeah. Hey, you had some money to donate not too long ago, didn't you? Yeah. Can you tell me why you decided of all the places you could donate your money that you decided to donate to Boonshoft? Because I love it and I really love it because I get to see lots of cute animals and stuff. I can learn new things about them. Yeah. So you wanted to take care of the animals with the money that you donated? Yeah. All right. You are awesome. <laughs> All right, Kisu, bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Melody, for your continued support. And here is Lennox's completed masterpiece. Now, Lennox has lived here at the museum for around 30 years. So another animal that has a great home here at the museum who needed a home. He was actually an abandoned pet. But he's only really gotten artistic probably over the past two or three years. So this is just one painting that you could possibly get from one of our animals here at the Boonshoff Museum. And thank you, Melody, so much for your continued support. We really appreciate it. And it does really help us to make sure our animals are receiving the best quality of care. And now I'm gonna hand it on over to Tracy and Peyton. And thank you so much, Stephanie. That just shows that it's not only humans who have talent. Apparently animals have more artistry skills than I do. Well, speaking of what is natural, we are here in front of the planetarium. I'm here with Tracy. Tracy, can you talk to me about some of the astronomy programs that are here at the Boonshaft? Absolutely. This is one of my favorite areas, I won't lie. Mine too. <laughs> So we do have a very strong, a strong astronomy program. That's astronomy. Tough it's a tough word sometimes. It's been a long night, you guys. It's been a long time. Um, and it, we're here at the Carol D. Phillips Theater. We do all kinds of programming in here. We have programs for three-year-olds all the way up to seniors. Throw in a little bit of the Valentine shows like you saw earlier. My favorite. And, and then, you know, um, Pink Floyd shows, Rainforest shows. And, you know, Jason and his team, they create a lot of that content. I Which is crazy. Yeah. yeah, so Jason is our director of astronomy. He's been here for 25 years. He actually was coming here as a five-year-old, as a child, got so hooked on it, went on, came back as an intern, and then kept on going with us. Started out running the planetarium, and now he runs the whole astronomy side. And that just really says something, again, about how people come back here. He it does. really is it about does. the people here. Yeah. So Jason should be coming through anytime because I don't know, we need to get, Jason, we need to get you up on the roof. And there he is. It's time. He's here. It's time for your segment <laughs> to start. So if you want to head on up, did you see his mask? I know. You guys have got to take a look at his mask. I saw it earlier. It's not only the mask, it's the tie as well. He's, he's going all in. But we're going to let Jason go right now because he's gonna... Maybe you can send us some pictures. Yes, send all us right. some pictures as he's going to take us into this next next. Wow, what is tonight? He's going to take us into this next segment, which is out of this world. Okay, Peyton mentioned my mask. Here it is. It's a, it's a nebula mask. Sorry for the shaky footage. I'm taking you with me on a behind-the-scenes tour. Okay, we are headed into my favorite room in the entire universe, our planetarium, where we take visitors to the edge of the universe. But today, we'll be traveling somewhere a lot closer to home, uh, the roof just above us. So let's go behind the scenes, head upstairs, and go outside. Behind me, you'll see the roof of our planetarium and our observatory. And down below is our parking lot. We will be using our parking lot to show you a low cost and fun way to portray the, the size and scale of our solar system. This is going to be a perfect place to demonstrate how far apart the planets are from our sun. We've selected this particular spot so we could show the perspective of our parking lot from our roof as well as an aerial perspective using Google Earth. We'll be using Google Earth to measure distances. For this experiment, which you can do at home, you'll need something to represent the planets and the sun. I'm using these little devices, which we call planet cans, or the soda pop solar system. Here's how it works. While everyone knows that the planets and the sun are spheres, not everyone has a series of globes sitting around the house to represent the moon, the earth, or the sun, and so on. You probably do have access to aluminum cans of some kind, and so at the Boonshaft, we've developed these. 
if you are able to print things at home, you can make these yourself by printing out our Soda Pop Solar System Activity Guide. It has designs sized to wrap around cans, plus other activity ideas that you can use these planet cans for. This activity guide is available for now on our website under Boonshoft at Home. You'll also need a few cans, a way to measure things, such as a yardstick, some tape, and perhaps sidewalk chalk. To make the can, simply cut out the pattern, find a can, and tape the design around it. For the purpose of this demonstration, we are going to pretend that the sun is not a giant sphere, but instead the diameter of a regular can, which is about three inches wide. This is also about the size of an orange. Whatever you choose to use, pretend that the sun, the largest object in our solar system, is only three inches wide. We are now going to place our cans in our parking lot to demonstrate how far apart the planets are from the sun. We will also be drawing in our parking lot with sidewalk chalk to represent orbits, and we'll use Google Earth to check our measurements. If the sun were only three inches wide, then Mercury would only be the size of a single grain of sand. That's pretty difficult to see, so instead we'll be using this Mercury can. We placed our Mercury can 10 and a half feet away from our sun, and we also drew a chalk circle to represent its orbit, or its path around the sun. Our Google Earth view shows a picture from a different day, where the parking lot had more cars in it. That's normal. Google Earth is always going to show an image from the past. On this image, our sun can would be here where this white car is. We'll place our next can now. Venus, the second planet from the sun, would be about 19 feet away. We'll need to place our Earth can about 26 and a half feet away. Mars, the red planet, is almost 41 feet away. These four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are the rocky planets and are sometimes referred to as the inner solar system. Here is the view using Google Earth. Next, we'll move on to the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, commonly known as the gas giants. It might be difficult to use a yardstick for measuring, so we measured lengths of yarn beforehand for each of these planets. These gas giant planets are larger in scale. Again, if the sun were the size of a three inch can, then Jupiter would be about the size of a cherry pit. Jupiter in our scaled down model is 138 feet away from our sun. Once again, here is the view from our rooftop perspective. We've added some leftover yarn to represent Saturn's extensive ring system. Saturn is placed 85 yardsticks of yarn away, or about 253 feet. At this point, you might start to understand that the solar system is much larger than you might imagine. If you would like to continue, you can proceed to the planet Uranus. We've placed our Uranus can here, which after checking with Google Earth later, was not far enough. Uranus at 509 feet away would actually put us in our pond at the edge of our parking lot. To place Neptune, you'll need to measure out 800 feet. That puts us at the far end of the pond. And even though Pluto is no longer considered a planet, it's included in our activity guide. Poor tiny Pluto would be more than three football fields away at 1,050 feet. That is almost exactly the height of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Plotting things out like this gives you an idea of how far apart the planets are from the sun. Next, I'd like to introduce you to a, a close friend of mine, uh, Randy Ekman. I met Randy as a kid. He came to the museum and had a dream. He wanted to one day work for NASA. Fast forward and lo and behold, Randy Ekman does in fact work for NASA. He's a trajectory analyst for the next program, taking humans back to the moon. So please say hello to Dayton's own Randy Ekman. My name is Randy Ekman, and I am a trajectory analyst at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I work on the mission design team for human spaceflight, um, supporting specifically the Orion spacecraft in designing future missions to the moon um, as part of the Artemis program to try to return humans back to the surface of the moon in the next few years. Um, I got my start in the space business, though, actually working at the Boonshoff Museum, uh, first as a volunteer and then later as an employee in the planetarium. Uh, and I 
spent many hours um, presenting shows, talking about the sky tonight, or doing laser shows, but also uh, working on the design, installation, and setup of, of the Science and Sphere exhibit, um, also uh, helping out um, with the redesign of the Hall of the Universe, and also participating in many different uh, programs uh, with the education uh, department and, uh, and, uh, and obviously the astronomy department. Um, I think that the thing that I personally took away the most from my time at the Boonshoft was uh, working with the public and, and you know, realizing that you know, no matter what uh, a, a particular child's background is, who their parents are, you know, the circumstances that they grew up in, all kids have the same curiosity and they ask the same kinds of questions and it's always fun to see that look in their eyes when they finally understand the world around them. Um, and and I, I found that such a profound thing um, that I don't know that I really appreciated before I worked at the museum. Um, but I think that that says a lot about what the museum means to the community, being this bastion of access to STEM education opportunities, resources um, that you just really can't find in any other, uh, you know, organization really uh, in, in the whole Dayton area. So I was very grateful to grow up in the greater Dayton area, um, not too far from the museum. And so it was uh, easy for us to get there and, and go and spend a lot of a lot of times uh, playing around in the museum, even before they had all of the, the cool playground and everything like they have now. I was a science nerd all the way back then and enjoyed some of the more, you know, uh, very kind of plain, if you will, uh, exhibits and whatnot. But I think that what they have now is such a, a great immersive environment um, that it's just an experience that you can't get anywhere else in the Dayton area. And it's such a, a valuable resource to the community. And I'm grateful to have been a part of it. Um, and, and it helped me get started on my career because I know that when they interviewed me for my position, the question, one of the questions that I got asked was about seeing the museum on my resume. And uh, it, it left a big impact on, on uh, the folks from NASA when they, when they interviewed me. So that's what the museum means to me. So we're back in the planetarium. And I wanted to mention something else about Randy. He's, um, he's been a really big supporter of our place. Not only does he help us, but of course we helped him. His journey wasn't overnight in getting to NASA. He volunteered, he worked here, he went to Purdue, which is a feeder school. And uh, you know, a volunteer that started here is now writing code that'll get humans back to the moon. And I think that's uh, really remarkable. So the Boonshoft is instrumental and can help lots of people. So if you are interested in volunteering or know somebody that would like to, or somebody that just wants to be involved or even curious about the universe, please send them our way. Thank you so much, Jason. And I had to bring out some of my own masks. These are just a couple, you guys. I've got white sequins, I've got lace, I've got some mermaid sequins as well, but Jason, yours still stands out. I need the astronomy mask. I have to say, since we've had the mask mandate with COVID-19, I've made it a personal hobby of mine to start collecting masks. So I have to have yours next. It's, it's a bad habit. It really is. Well, technically, it's a pretty good habit because we're keeping people safe, and that is our priority. But what also is our priority tonight is this live auction, as our educational programs here are so important. And I think it's about time that we see where we are within the night. Thanks, Peyton. You know, she loves those masks, I know. Jill. Does she know we have? I, you know, I don't think she's seen them These yet. are space themed yep. and they go along with our collection yep. too. They're beautiful masks. And actually, let me check here. They're up to $106. The mask, the mask, Whoa! Whoa! I'm throwing them. The mask collection is yep. 106 right now. And they're That's awesome amazing. because they are really well made. They are made of cotton. They have a filter. And they're all beautiful. the fabrics, as Tracy said, are specially selected to represent the museum. Did so. you know there was a sloth? That's a meerkat. Oh, sorry. That's a meerkat. <laughs> did you know there's a meerkat? I did. I like that one. I think there. Oh, yeah. Okay. And there's otters. Okay, there's all sorts. I love, I love it. it. <laughs> they're great. They're great. You have to have them. 
you have to have. These are beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. so, you know, it is bash, and I wanna make sure that, uh, even though we're doing a little bit differently this evening, and I know there's a lot of people at home, and a lot of people in some watch parties going on, mm -hmm. I would ask you to please, while we're giving a little update on the auction, please charge your glasses, because we do want to make a toast here in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So take this time to charge your glasses. Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, Joe, what's our hottest items tonight? Well, Tracy, the hottest one is dinner at your house. And with curlers or without? I'm going to tell you guys at home. If you saw our <laughs> Facebook Live segment, if you want to bid a little extra, we can throw in the curlers. I could, I mean, for, yeah, I won't say it can be bought, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, for all for a good cause only. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm glad that's trending well. So that's doing well. We have okay. our nest here is in second place. And she's gorgeous. And Sabertooth Cat coming in third. That's so, awesome. So do we have some uh, bargains still? Some um, things you think could do a little bit better this let evening? Let's see. Oh, so something that has yet to receive any bids is actually our trilobite jewelry. I moved them over here because I thought maybe. So, so yeah. yeah. These are beautiful. They are actual castings, mm -hmm. and you could say more about that. I would just say, you know, if you don't like the, the chain, that's not the point. Yeah. The chain and the length, that can be changed out easily, but yeah. the castings are actually from the collection. Yes. Do you want to speak to that a little so bit? So these are all trilobites that we have up in our collection. We worked with our molding and casting team to make these molds, and these are some of the first casts to come out the molds, just like the saber tooth cat. So these are seriously one of a kind and there is no one else in the world who has this exact piece of jewelry and I can tell you I know some people watching have some really awesome jewelry collections Pat <laughs> and no are, pressure no pressure <laughs> but these are really cool very unique and they support the museum so I would definitely wear these they're beautiful they are beautiful all right um, and we also have some of our higher priced objects um, like we have this Jonathan Pincus print. I love this print. Um, again, this is a print called Wounded Predator. And it's, it's created, um, you, the, basically, um, Jonathan is an amazing artist, if you're familiar with his work. And this was made through copper etching. So you would etch a copper plate, put in India ink, and then press it onto the paper. So it's like an inverse painting. I love so it. So the quality is so high. Um, also, our pileated woodpecker up here, which again, this was um, hand carved by David McDonald. And if you've ever seen any of his work, they, the detail, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's life size, it's gorgeous. Um, and he's only ever sold, to my knowledge, one other in his entire life. So this is a one of a kind deal. I don't know if you at home can tell how great these pieces are, but they are I, beautiful. Well, let's say we twisted his arm, but we may have. Come on. We may have a little yeah. bit. I uh, know. I think that's great. We appreciate it. We love it. So we really appreciate everyone who has donated all of these beautiful pieces. Mm -hmm. Every dollar that's given this evening comes back to the museum. We're not paying any of these artists anything for their expenses or time do to want, put these pieces together. Do you want to know the total? Where Let's are we at? And get it. Jill's going to look up the total. So while she's looking that up, I just want to ask you, please continue to bid. Wait. <laughs> it's twelve thousand five hundred and thirty-seven dollars. Awesome, virtual. good virtual high five. <laughs> so we're up to twelve thousand five hundred. I think we can do better. I think people are just getting yeah. warmed up a little bit. So um, remember that how much we do for this community. Remember what we're going through right now. We are still feeding animals. We are still taking in some collection items. We are still taking care of our collections and our people. And I want everyone to please, please dig deep and support us on that. We are doing so much in education and trying to support as much as we can. Educational programming, free programming, learning pods. It's like we're doing everything we can. Yeah. We do need your help and support at this time. But I want to take a minute, get your glass. Oh, I'm ready. To everyone yes. who's sponsored, who's on the board of trustees, yeah. who's on the associate board, because they have been phenomenal through this whole process, who has bought a ticket, yeah. who has bid on an auction item. Thank Here's you. a cheers to you. Thank you cheers. so much. And now we're going to pass it to Peyton in the zoo. Get on Peyton.
And you guys, right now, I'm, I'm hanging out. I'm chilling with the animals again. This is, this is my scene all night. And this is another really important part of the boom shop, you know, taking care of the animals, feeding the animals. It's very expensive, which is why this fundraiser tonight is so important. And how could you not want to support this cute face? Oh, of course, now he's not looking. Come on. Oh, there he is. There is the superstar tonight. He's one of the three meerkats here. As you guys know, also, the otters are my favorite. We've got to support them. But also something that is very important here at the Boone Shop is STEM education. And right now, we're going to toss it over to Don, who's going to give us a little bit of a demonstration. Thanks, Peyton. I'm so excited to be here with you all this evening. I have some really cool science plan, pun intended, and I think you'll see why. So here at the Boone Shop Museum of Discovery, when we do programs, we like to take either really complex science topics and break them down to make it a little bit easier to understand or we like to take really basic science concepts and turn it into a an experience that lasts for a lifetime so i'm actually today going to be doing a basic science concept and hopefully it's something that will stick with you forever so i'm sure you all remember matter from elementary science back when you were kids and essentially remember matter is the stuff around us Typically, we experience matter as solids, liquids, and gases, although there are a few other states of matter that we're not going to talk about today, but maybe you'll be enticed to look them up. So solids, pretty easy to understand. You're all probably watching me while sitting on a solid chair. Liquids, like the stuff that comes out of your tap, pours and takes on the shape of whatever container they happen to be poured into. And gases, well, they're a little more tricky because we can't really see them, but Every time we take a breath, we know they're there. Now, gases being the tricky one, that's what we really want to focus on today. And we're going to end on really understanding the expanse that gas takes up. So today, as I do my demonstrations, I'm going to be using an element called nitrogen. And nitrogen is one of the most abundant gases in our atmosphere, about 78% nitrogen. Now, as I do this, I'm going to protect myself. I've got some eyeglasses, my lab coat, and some gloves as well. Now the apparatus I'm gonna be using today is called a dewer. And this dewer keeps my nitrogen very, very cold. So right now you're noticing this is a liquid. So liquid nitrogen is extremely cold. It's about 320 degrees below zero. Very, very, very cold, okay? Now, as you're watching, you probably see stuff going on. You're essentially seeing a cloud form. All of the water vapor in the atmosphere, it's starting to condense into a liquid forming this cloud. And you're probably hearing something as well. That's actually the liquid nitrogen heating and boiling off. At temperatures that are comfortable to us, like today, it's in the 70s right now, it's so hot that the liquid nitrogen boils, turning into a gas, but we're not really seeing it. But wait a little bit longer. Now I'm gonna add just a little bit more. I do have some fruit inside of my bowl. I'm gonna use my tongs to show you, maybe, there we go. So my banana is very, very, very cold, right? I'm gonna put it in just a little while longer. I wanna make sure it's extra cold. And you may think, well, what's the point of having something like liquid nitrogen? Well, this is actually great for transporting food. I like to use food as an example because that's how we transport food from one coast to the other to keep it fresh and nutritionally uh, rich. But very quickly, I've got some lovely flowers. I'm just gonna dip those in. Now, of course, flowers and fruit are made of a lot of water, as are our bodies. When dipped into this very, very cold liquid nitrogen, those flowers become very, very brittle. Again, this is why I'm wearing gloves. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pick up my orange. And it is frozen solid. Same thing, let's, let's take a look at that banana. It's so cold that it actually broke in half. Pretty impressive. Now, we're gonna get a little more impressive than just this. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pour some of the liquid nitrogen into a two liter bottle, and then I'm gonna cap the lid off. 
So we're going to think like scientists right now, and I want you to think about what might happen if I trap liquid nitrogen in a closed container and then put another container on top. We're going to put that to the test. So again, I'm pouring my liquid nitrogen in. I am actually going to switch, just in case, a little bit more protection. Put a little bit more in here. And as we fill it up the rest of the way, I have Julia, one of our educators, who's going to help with this demonstration. And as I'm walking over, I'm going to cap. Julia's ready to go. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. I hope you really enjoyed that demonstration, and I hope you can see how that demonstration about liquids evaporating into a gas and the force that they produce when trapped really stays with you and excites you. Science education is such an important thing in all of our lives. I made my career choice based on the first job that I had while I was still in grad school, which actually happened to be right here in the Boonshock Museum of Discovery Zoo. And we're actually right now going to hear from another individual, Dr. Shawnee Maisie, who had a similar experience making her career choice from the Boonshock Museum. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Hello, my name is Dr. Shawnee Maisie, and I am a veterinarian and owner of Shiloh Animal Hospital in Dayton, Ohio which is very close to the Boonshop Museum. The Boonshop Museum has had a great influence on my life. In fact, one of the biggest influences uh, in my entire life. When I was 12 years old, I began volunteering at the museum and instantly fell in love with animal care and actually everything to do with animals. It was there that I met and was able to observe Dr. Chris Hall, who was the museum's veterinarian for many, many years. And when I saw him suturing up the wing of a great blue heron, it was that instant that I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. And from that moment forward, that was my goal, and I never wavered until I met that goal. And if I had never gone to the museum to volunteer and eventually work for the next six years, I'm not sure I would be where I am today. So I am very grateful to the museum, which back then was the Dayton Museum of Natural History, which is now the Boonshop Museum. So I owe my entire career and path of my life to my journey I had at the museum. So I am very grateful to have had that experience in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maisie, for sharing your story. It is incredible to hear how many people's lives have been influenced by coming here to the museum over so many years. So we're going to continue that and keep this evening going. Right now, I'm standing here in front of Nessier, our mommy. Nessier has been on continuous display with the museum since she was donated in 1926. She is a very special um, piece of our collection and is just one of the many, many items that we curate here. If you haven't been into the Ancient Egypt exhibit, I would suggest that you do try to come by and see it. It has not been open for very long, um, opening just really before we had to close our doors. 
And it, what I think is most special about this exhibition is all of the work was done in-house. Our team is very talented. When you come in, you will notice that it is high quality and we did it all here. I want to introduce you to one of the superstars of that, Jill Krieger Krakow. She leads the team that put all of this together. And Jill is our curator of anthropology and exhibits. We're going to go see her in her natural element as she tells us some stories from the vaults. Thanks, Tracy. If you've ever been on a collections tour here with me at the museum, you've probably heard me talk about some of our most prominent donors. People like Virginia Kettering, one of our community's strongest supporters of museums, and J. Morton Howell, the first U.S. ambassador to Egypt who actually donated our mummy Nessier. But tonight, I'm going to change it up a little bit and talk to you about somebody you may not have heard of before, Charles Jessup Moore, or CJ. CJ was born in 1855 in Indiana. He marries a woman named Ella, and they make their way to the Dayton community while CJ goes into banking. He actually becomes the president of the Third National Bank and Trust. Through his time in banking, he befriends somebody named Dr. Ambrose A. Plotner. Now, Plotner is a very well-known figure in the community, and he's a collector. But Plotner never marries, so when he passes away in 1932, he names CJ as one of the beneficiaries in his estate and gives him some pieces from his collection. CJ keeps those pieces until his death, death in 1942. And the objects are then transferred to CJ's daughter, Mary Moore Custer. Mary keeps them for a while, but she doesn't really know what to do with them. So now we're in 1946, and Mary is probably seeing the museum in the newspaper a lot. This is the time when we are beginning our journey to separate from the library, and we have just received a big donation from the Philippines. So Mary probably thinks, hmm, this stuff should probably go to the local museum. So she gets her son, James Custer, and they bring the objects to the museum and donate them. And as happened so many times, the name on the actual donation form is her son, James, not hers, even though the objects actually came from her. I have the actual donation card here that James signed in 1946 when he was only 23 years old. So James himself has since passed away, but I recently had the opportunity to talk to his wife, Patricia, who's in her 90s. And it was so interesting to talk to somebody who actually remembers this story. So, I'm going to share with you some of the objects from the donation. First, we have these two wooden figures. These are called Moai Tengata, and they are from Easter Island. They resemble the large stone statues from Easter Island that we're probably all used to seeing. We're not 100% sure the cultural context of these objects, but we know they were ceremonial. And many of them will have holes drilled into the neck, so they can be suspended from the body and worn during ceremonies. In order to have these objects sold to the tourist trade, they had to be deactivated of their ritual power. So if you look at this figure right here, he's actually missing one of his eyes, and that's intentional. The eye was popped out to deactivate the figure. The eyes themselves are really cool because they're made from ivory and obsidian. So if you look at these two figures, one is authentic, made in the early 1800s, and the other is a copy made in like the 1910s, 1920s. So which one do you think is real? The smaller guy is actually the real one. This is a copy. It's a really good copy. It even mimics the eye being popped out to deactivate, and you can see the glue residue left where the one eye used to be before that fell out at some point. We also have another wooden figure heel called a moko. The moko is a composite supernatural being. He has a lizard head and tail, the wings of, the, of a bird, and the body of a human. So you would take the moko and put it in a doorway or an entryway into a ceremonial space to protect you while you're doing kind of important things. We also have a shell lei from Tahiti. 
and a sand bottle here from the Pacaran Islands. And these two objects were made in the early 1900s. These are just a really small sampling of objects from the Plotner donation and an even smaller piece of the collection as a whole with 1.8 million objects, nearly 2 million objects, so that's a lot. These stories inspire me so much and I know they've inspired countless other people. So we're about to hear from one of those people, Phyllis Johnson, who's my really, really good friend. We actually interned at the museum together in 2007, so I hope you enjoy her story. My name is Phyllis Johnson, and I worked for the Boonshaft for three summers as part of their archaeological internship program. Um, working for the Boonshaft influenced me in so many ways. It was one of my first experiences as an archaeologist. It was my first chance to um, teach other people about archaeology, my first chance to lead a summer internship. Um, uh, it helped me focus my career path in many, many ways. Um, the advice that I received from the curator at the time has been invaluable to my career. And one of the biggest pieces of advice that I remember that he gave me was that the people that you will work with during the internship are going to become your lifelong peers and colleagues. And that has been one of the biggest influences of my time at the Boomshaft is all of the friendships that I have made and the people that I'm still very close with that I worked with during that time. Um, many of those friendships and uh, relationships are invaluable to me. So thank you for allowing me to meet those people and work with those people and have those experiences. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And Tracy, it's so great that we continue to keep hearing about people who started here at the Boom Shop, and then they continue to tell us how much it means to them, and they're coming back. What does that mean to you? I love it. I love it. I mean, I've been here for just a year and a half, and I already can feel it for myself. Um, we have employees who come back. We have community members visit with me. I think this place just it gets into you like it's it just it just gets into your bloodstream you you become part of it it's very emotional it's very it brings out a lot of stuff in people um, and you know I love that about it and I hope that as children come here and they grow up into these adults who are now helping us and supporting us and working here and, and, and you know doing these testimonials I just think it's so important and speaking on that emotional value, as you had just said, we're hearing a lot from other people and what this means to them. But Tracy, you are a part of this every single day. You are really in the boom shop. You really know what it's about. What does it mean to you personally? I went to it I means everything. Yeah. I mean, we came here to Dayton just for this. We love it here. It's going to make me cry. It's okay. But I, uh, I love it here. I love the people I've met. I love our staff and our employees and our board of trustees and all of our sponsors and donors. I just think that, you know, when you go out in the community and you, they say, what do, you, what do you do here? And you say, I work at the Boom Shop. People are like, oh, I love the Boom Shop. And it's like, yes, that is what just, we love I've never to do. Because they know. To keep doing that. Yes. And, and speaking of keeping, to, to be able to keep doing that, they need yeah. more. The auction happen. is still going. We still want you to be participate. Jill, we need a little bit of an update, I think. Where are we right now in this auction? Well, we have two minutes left. And we're at close to a little over thirteen thousand dollars. That's good. That's good. Two minutes. You have two minutes left. So if you haven't donated and you want to, you still have enough time to put it in there. And then Jill's gonna shut it down in two minutes. One minute. In one minute. One minute. One Sixty minute. seconds, you guys. This is the time to bring it in right now. Jill, what's our hottest item? Um, dinner at your house. <laughs> With or without curlers. <laughs> And you have to provide the for your guests. Oh my goodness. So we're adding we're another notch. We're adding we're another that. notch, you guys. We're, we're bumping it up even more. We're bumping it up even more. Awesome. Good. Thank you, Jill. And this event, we've been going all night, but is there anybody else that, you know, you want to talk about right now? Because it's not just what we're showing tonight. We're only showing Absolutely. you a certain aspect of the Boon Shop. There's so many things that really go into behind the scenes here. So through this whole different way of doing bash, and there's only a few of us here tonight, but you see the team that was presenting and here we have Jill who did the curations in exhibits uh, episode and also is of course running all of the auction items right now. 
Dawn, welcome back from the parking lot. Thank you, and to your team who helped you out with that. Stephanie with paint still on her hands <laughs> from doing a little animal like experience there. As Stephanie, I think I could paint like an otter or a sloth, I mean, with the nose. I think I could. We'll work on that. If you'll give me some time. We're all getting our artistic abilities out there We're tonight. trying. Everybody's trying. We're trying. <laughs> uh, I know, you know, Matt was like super instrumental, Matt Mercer, uh, at getting those bags out today and like connecting with everyone. I'm sure I'm going to leave some people out. Guest services helped. Everybody has been important. I mean, we have all these pieces that were donated even right. by our employees. I just love that. We knew they were talented. I thought they were talented. They are super talented. And you know, we've been working on this, you know, how to do this creatively for quite some time. And I've been seeing more pieces tonight than I even <laughs> saw earlier. So it's like, oh my goodness, there's even know, more things. I there's know. more items came for people really to choose well. from. Yeah. The option. Okay, the option is closed. Okay. You could still donate if you want to donate and feel free. We'll take donations any day of the week or the year, it's fine. But I do want to introduce one more person. Uh, Michael Westendorf is here. He is our CFO, and Michael is going to let us know. I'm going to put on my Texas Tech mask. There we go. Don't Getting the masks. Me. We're prepared. <laughs> All right, Michael. How do, how do we do for this event overall? Pretty well. Okay, so overall, with our ticket sales, with our auction items, and with our sponsors, Michael tells me we are just around sixty-six thousand dollars for this good. evening. Wow! That's wow. not bad. That's I would take good. That's high five! Good. High five! High five! And to you at home, if you still have a drink, which I do not, cheers to you. Thank you for all of your support. And he has an interesting story in connection to the Boone Shop does, as well. Can you does. talk about that? <laughs> so Michael is actually from Dayton, grew up here, came here as a child, uh, loves to as he came back here, walk around after hours, which many of us kind of do, I found out, and, <laughs> and just kind of like experience this by ourselves on our own time. And I think that right now, even though we're kind of quiet and we're only running, you know, between 15 and 25% capacity, I think that's true for guests as well. Like you, you don't have any crowd, you don't have anybody tripping over you. It's a great time actually. It's a different experience. To come back and, and right. have it to yourself. Yeah. So, and we keep hearing those stories where people continue to come back. It's just really about that full circle. And that's really what we want to talk about. And I, I really want to emphasize that aspect that this is only the things that we're putting out for show. What is some of the work that the Boone Shop does behind the scenes and for the community? Oh, well, we have uh, over 80 videos that we started producing with Dawn's team immediately right after we closed down for the COVID crisis. So Mackenzie and Vicki, who are behind the scenes right now, jumped in and within like two days of us shutting down, they're, they're high-fiving, but you can't see them. Um, <laughs> they were able to start producing these videos and bless them, they didn't know they were in video production roles, but now they are. So we do a lot of distance learning. We transferred that into free programming. Um, and so we, we've done so much with that team. And then, you know, now we have the learning pod. So if that's helpful to some parents who might have students in school, they just want them proctored. You know, you, you want to make sure they're safe and healthy, but you also need to do your job. So we're, we're uh, providing that kind of support. We're, of course, taking care of all of our animals because we want to make sure that they have the right food and quality and no, no. Um, experience, no, no. you know, right. like you're right. You're right. welfare right. and, you know, activities. So we're taking care of the animals, which are missing people. They are, they are missing people. But they we need you guys. They, do. they need us here. <laughs> and, you know, Jill is working on even taking in some new collections at this time, which is super taxing but really good that people trust us with those items to keep them on display and for the public for the next 127 years and this pandemic has really impacted especially here at the Boone shop but what are some of the positive things that you kind of have been able to see in some of the response to this I think uh, you know it's been great because we have just kept moving forward we have not gone into a panic mode and we just keep trying to remember why we are here and what we do. So if we can just keep doing what we do, 
we'll just keep doing that and and you know go on because like i said we're we're nowhere near stopping what, everything that we do for the community and as people tell us you know we would like to see this or we'd like to see that we take all of that into account right. and do everything we can to just give back and take care of these collections take care of our guests and customers as they come through and and I, truly i just can't believe you know the donors and the support we've had tonight. It's just phenomenal. And it makes sense to me because I've seen personally firsthand what you guys have done in response for, for kids, for education, with some of the things that you guys have, have developed here to improve that for kids, even Absolutely. with kids doing things virtually from home. Yeah. And we thank you for that, Peyton. <laughs> so you have been great this evening. We do have a little thank you. What? Do we have it here? <laughs> we do. What? This is not... Oh my god, this is so cute! This is from our otter. Oh, you guys, this was just like the art that you saw earlier tonight. I get to take one home with me. That one's yours. Thank you so much, Tracy. Oh my goodness, thank you, you guys. And this concludes the end of tonight. Again, you guys, I said earlier, you know, tonight that things are a little bit different and they are. We should be close together. We should be together for an event like this. And I shouldn't have to talk to you through the screen, but we've made it happen. We've gotten creative. We've made this event happen and we want to share that experience with you. We want you to share that experience with us. So if you have any pictures at home on your couch as you guys were watching tonight with your family cheersing, we want to see that. So make sure you send those pictures, those videos, anything to the Boone Shop Facebook and the Boone Shop Instagram. And you guys enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much for letting me join you for tonight. Stay safe. Wear a cute mask. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely and the cute mask. Wear a cute mask. Thank you so much. Thank you, Faith.